Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About It. This is your host, Taylor, and I hope that you all are taking care of yourselves. I hope that you are excited coming into this episode. We are going to be talking about a topic that we have never talked about on the podcast before and introducing you all to a lovely, lovely human that I really hope that you guys go and check out and follow her work and support her because she's amazing and I'm so thrilled to share her with y'all. Before we get into our topic of the day, which is going to be pelvic floor therapy, um, I do want to do a little bit of a check-in because there's a lot of things happening, okay? (laughs) We are basically in October at this point and the seasons are changing. You know, I imagine that many of us are going through a big period of transition. I know I am myself and I think especially during times of transition, it is crucial to practice self-compassion. So as a reminder, self-compassion is a practice. It might feel a little like woo-woo-y and like this isn't doing anything or, you know, it's just too hard. It's not practical, but it is literally just being kind to yourself, giving yourself some perspective. And just reminding yourself that you're not alone. So Dr. Kristen Neff uh, has kind of broken down the components of self-compassion. She has a fantastic book I highly recommend uh, where self-compassion is broken down into three components. First is kindness, second is mindfulness, and the third is common humanity. So in beating yourself up and going through shame spiral, remember, be kind to yourself. (laughs) You are a good person mindfulness. This is really hard right now. You're feeling stressed out. Common humanity. You are not alone. Many people struggle with this. This is not unique to you. And just see how that feels. Just say that internally. If you feel like you can't believe it internally, speak that shit. Okay. (laughs) There are so many times where I'm driving and I end up just talking to myself or I'm walking or I'm like doing my skincare and I just end up talking to myself and saying these things out loud because when I actually feel it come out of my mouth, like I vocalize it through my throat, I feel like I'm giving that power and I am giving it conviction and I'm helping myself to actually actually believe it. So sometimes you need to take that extra step and speak it. (laughs) Affirm yourself and practice that self-compassion out loud if it feels like it's easy to get into that shame spiral internally and maybe the thoughts are just fighting each other so much. Speak it. Speak it with conviction. You might cry, right? You might, some feelings might come up as you do it (laughs) and that's okay. Those need to come up. Those need to flow through you and just make sure that as they flow through you, you're trying to be kind to yourself, that you're being mindful of what it is you're experiencing, right? You're being present in it and that you're reminding yourself that you are human. This is a part of the human experience and sometimes it is hard and that you are not alone, So self-compassion, it's a daily practice. It's almost like an hourly practice, I think, for many of us. (laughs) Um, So I hope that this can kind of stick with you throughout your week. And I want to talk a little bit about our guest today before we get into our lovely interview. Um, So I found Dr. Q, Dr. Quozette, um, on Instagram and... I literally went through every single reel she has posted. I don't use TikTok, but she posts a lot of things on TikTok as well. Um, And I was just like, yo, she seems like such a cool ass bitch. And like her personality is just shining through. It's amazing. And she making hella points. She was really making some points. Okay. Um, So I'm so excited to have her on the show today. She is a licensed physical therapist. She she practices um, in LA area, specializing in the treatment of pelvic floor dysfunction and conditions that affect bladder, bowel, and reproductive systems. So we are really going to get into 
all like the fluidy stuff, right? We're going to talk about poop today. We're going to talk about urination today. We're going to talk about painful penetration and sex. Um, so as always, I hope that you've got an open mind, an open heart, and open ears, and we can challenge ourselves and also learn some shit. So <laughs> with all of that said, let's talk about it. All right. So welcome, Dr. Q, to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time out to chat with me today. Of course. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. I'm wondering like how often you talk to people or tell people what you do and people are like, wait, what? That exists? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Like every day. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I think the question of what do you do for a living or what do you do for work comes up in everybody's lives. I think the uniqueness of, of what I do Mm -hmm. almost always transitions into a much more deeper conversation, Mm -hmm. depending on the, on the person who's asking about, you know, how did we not know this existed or do you treat men too? Mm Because I think at this point there's a, a general understanding, not a deep understanding, yeah. depending on the location of what it is, but not exactly who it can help. Mm-hmm. Um, majority of the general public being aware that it can help prenatal postpartum. Yeah. But I have been trying to be more vocal about, well, we do other things too, uh, but mm-hmm. that is kind of the bread and butter. Uh, mm-hmm. But all the time, I mean, barbecues, Christmas parties. It doesn't matter yeah. if it comes up, it comes up. And I think it's, be, it's been more often lately because mm-hmm. of social media. That, so people oh, know yeah. what I do. And then when I actually see my friends in person or I see somebody who didn't know what I do, then it obviously mm-hmm. comes up a lot. Yeah. 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 I think it's really interesting because pelvic floor therapy is not something that I was super aware of. And then, you know, through um, getting into my program and learning more about just like sex therapy and our sexuality in general, learning just how important the pelvic floor is. I think I really actually learned about it through um, Betty Dodson and her like masturbation technique and doing like the rock and roll where Uh like you have to activate the pelvic floor in order to like Uh get those muscles excited for orgasm or even for relaxing for penetration. Um, But then even literally right before we got on this recording, I was on the phone with a man and um, told him, yeah, I'm recording about pelvic floor therapy. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm all about that. Like said something about how he's got, he does, um, I'm totally blanking on what the name of it was, but basically Mm -hmm. like the exercises that he does um, with something to like strengthen his pelvic floor. And I was like, yeah, there you go. See, men too. (laughs) Everybody has one. Everybody Mm -hmm. has a pelvic floor. Yeah. Yeah. So can you share a little bit like, cause I'm sure there's folks listening that are like, well, what is pelvic floor therapy? Um, <laughs> can you share a little bit about maybe kind of on a surface level, what pelvic floor therapy is, and then we can kind of go in a little bit deeper into it. Of course. Yeah. So I'm b- by trade, I'm a physical therapist and I'm mm-hmm. an outpatient orthopedic physical therapist that specializes in pelvic health. So what that basically means is that we, we part we very specifically look at the musculoskeletal system as physical therapists. Mm -hmm. The pelvic floor just happens to be a group of muscles within that system. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you can argue that we're just like any other PT. We just happen to treat symptoms more specific to that area of the body. And the pelvic floor muscles specifically are responsible for bladder, bowel, and sexual function Mm -hmm. in addition to providing just general stability for our pelvis and our whole trunk. So Mm -hmm. anything that changes with any of those symptoms or functions or symptoms, systems and functions, we help. So whether that's overactive bladder, urinary leakage, stress incontinence is a huge one that we treat. Um, We even do constipation, bowel Mm -hmm. irregularity. Uh, We do a lot with reproductive issues. So painful periods, um, endometriosis, adenomyosis. Mm. And these are all things that somebody might have and we're not necessarily resolving them with the therapy, but the whole purpose of physical therapy is to maintain and improve your quality of life from a movement perspective, from a functional Mm. movement perspective. And sometimes that includes 
um, higher level activities if you're in sports medicine, right? If you treat Mm -hmm. athletes, but for everyday people, it's really about maintaining function. So whether that's, you know, getting up and down the stairs or getting in and out of your car or bending to pick up the car seat with your toddler in it, all of those things that we need to be able to do is what a physical therapist helps you with. Hmm. When you throw in the pelvic floor, the things that we're trying to help and the quality of life we're trying to maintain involves very, very intimate and vulnerable parts of our day, using the restroom, sexual function. Um, For a lot of our patients, they're either prenatal or postpartum. And we have a saying, once you're postpartum, you're always postpartum. So whether you're Hmm. postpartum two weeks or you're two months, two years, 20 years, it doesn't matter. You've been through that. Your body Mm -hmm. has adjusted to that change. We can help with whatever physical symptoms you might be having. Um, so that's the general gist of it. Um, when people ask, what do you treat? I kind of just say, I I mean, I treat people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't treat just a diagnosis or just a condition. So I would say bladder, bowel, bedroom, and then obviously pregnancy, postpartum are the, Mm -hmm. the best ways to think about what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say that kind of how you approach these, how the systems are working is Mm -hmm. similar regardless of gender, regardless of genitals? For the most part, yes. I mean, bladder and bowel for sure. When it comes to sexual function, mm-hmm. they are there are a lot of similarities because the the only difference is the genitalia in terms of um, people with vaginal openings have mm-hmm. vaginas and uteruses typically, and then people with penises don't have that. Mm-hmm. They also have to, they also happen to have um, a prostate. So mm-hmm. I would argue that when you're looking at the systems in general, yeah, they're very similar and how they are treated with the therapy. Uh, the approach obviously has to change when you can't examine yeah. somebody vaginally. So if we're doing internals on anybody with a penis, it would have to be rectal or external, always with consent. It's mm-hmm. never required, always mm-hmm. recommended, but never required. Mm-hmm. That tends to scare people. <laughs> They're going yeah. to want to do any more exams. <laughs> um, but generally, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, the the presentations or the commonalities are different, um, but that's, you know, Hmm. that's just, there's a lot of gray area there, but yeah, they have the same muscles and they have the same organs for Mm -hmm. the most part. So they are treated just the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot of what you work with is women, um, prenatal postpartum. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's kind of the majority of what you see? I want to say yes. Cause like I just said, once you've had a kid, you're, you're always postpartum, but it's in all phases of life. So you can be somebody who mm-hmm. just had a baby or maybe you want to have a baby and you, you're having pain with intercourse. Mm-hmm. But a ton of patients who have pain with intercourse in their mid and early 20s who eventually want to conceive or they're already married and they've been married for two years, but they've only known intercourse that's painful. Mm-hmm. And so the concept of even trying to conceive is very stressful. So I would say pregnancy and postpartum is kind of the bread and butter. But Mm -hmm. if I had to guess, because so many of our patients, even the ones coming in for menopausal symptoms, even though we're not treating them for postpartum, their kids are maybe 20, 30, 40 years old at that point. Mm -hmm. We still might work on their C-section scar from that time. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's just such a common factor for at least people who have have that um, Mm -hmm. option, right? To have kids, that that's a big population. Um, but it's not always the pregnancy itself that we're treating, right? Mm -hmm. It's whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever physical baggage comes along with being pregnant or being postpartum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm curious because, you know, there are so many reasons why folks can have painful penetration, like vaginal Mm -hmm. sex. Um, and I'm wondering like in this space, is there like additional like training or education or that's like just up to you to like educate yourself on like what might be presenting if somebody's coming in with like a sexual uh, frustration or difficulty mm-hmm. around vaginal penetration? Like how is yeah. that, is that taught? <laughs> <laughs> so I, yes and no. And it could be changing because I've been a therapist for a little over six years now. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in school almost 10 years ago, when I first started PT school, no, it was not taught. It was pretty much 
a five second, maybe mm-hmm. not five second, five minute. <laughs> hey, by the way, there's muscles here and they do stuff. Yeah. So you want to yeah. learn more, just know that that exists. That's and, what I envision. <laughs> yeah. And there was, um, that's actually how I first learned about what it was. Mm. Now what you're seeing is some programs having either elective coursework where maybe it's not even a full semester class, but it's a six or eight week class where they learn Mm. the fundamentals Mm -hmm. more so for screening purposes, right? So if you're going to practice in a hospital or in a skilled nursing home and you happen to know somebody um, or one of your patients on your caseload has incontinence and you're like, Hey, you know, you should go see somebody who specializes in this, Mm -hmm. but majority of programs don't have it built into the curriculum. And sometimes Mm -hmm. if it's not structured as an elective. Honestly, I think only one program, at least in California does that. And that's Mount St. Mary's university in LA. Mm. They have like a half unit class that's required. So everybody Mm. coming out of that program is aware of it. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you choose to pursue it is post-grad, post-grad grad grad school. (laughs) But, Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's self- motivated. You'd have to want to do that. It's part of your continuing education, but there are some programs that ask, people like myself to do a one-time or a two-time lecture just to go mm-hmm. over in more detail the anatomy, how to have these questions or how to ask these questions subjectively. But in the coursework for people who specifically want to specialize, yes, they go over trauma-informed yeah. care, awareness of sexual trauma, mm-hmm. and there's different um, sub-courses. There's the main coursework, like the level one, two, three, um, and that used to be through the American PT Association. Mm-hmm. And then they just eventually branched off and did made it a private institution, but it's not necessarily standardized throughout the profession, but mm-hmm. there is private institutions and the APTA that has coursework that goes over some of this stuff. And then they might have yeah. a special topic just for sexual function, mm-hmm. just for trauma informed care, just for chronic pelvic pain. So mm-hmm. there's a ton, there's a ton of layers, but none of it, almost yeah. none of it is in the graduate level Mm -hmm. programs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, very similar with like mental health counseling, which is why I always tell people, like, if you are going to work with somebody who is going to do sex therapy with you, like double check and like ask questions about, you know, what their, what their training is, because most of the time just in your schooling, that's not, it's like you get one course. Um, Exactly. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how, I mean, so we're talking about like, you know, the kinds of people that would come to you, what kind of difficulties they might be having. um, But like, what exactly do you do with them? (laughs) So so like if somebody comes in, let's say with um, painful, with penetration vaginally, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. what does pelvic floor therapy even entail to help with that? Yeah. So the initial visit is a lot of of this talking, getting someone's background. How long has this been an issue? A lot of nitty gritty details that you would never Mm -hmm. think are important. We talk about. So when it's penetrative intercourse, that's the main problem. I'm asking, is it at the beginning during initial insertion? Is Mm -hmm. it during a friction? Is it in certain positions? Do you have pain with climax? Can you achieve climax? Is there a postcoital pain? Does Mm -hmm. it get better with certain positions or different lubrication? What have you tried that helps? What have you tried that not helps? Is it, does it change with your menstrual cycle? All of those details matter. And so much of the first visit is digging into that. Mm-hmm. Ideally, I do 45 minute sessions. So yeah, depending on the complexity, usually we'll try to get to some form of a physical exam in the first visit to get a general idea of their posture, how their mm-hmm. muscles are functioning, what their coordination looks like and other uh, um, orthopedic or musculoskeletal, you know, if they had a hip surgery in the past or ankle issues, we take mm-hmm. note of that just to see how it's affecting the pelvic floor. And then we can do an internal exam if that patient consents to that on that first day to then mm-hmm. assess the pelvic floor muscles internally. The therapeutic process, I it depends on what they're coming in for, but let's stick with that example of painful sex. Um, A lot of it is addressing what are the contributing factors and prioritizing which ones are the most, which ones are contributing the most. Because you'd be surprised how many people jump straight into the pelvic floor, assuming that, oh, if you can't have penetrative intercourse, your pelvic floor muscles are too tight. But Mm. when you think about muscles, one of my favorite colleagues. She's a brilliant physical therapist in Oregon. She always says muscles are stupid. 
<laughs> There's, they're, they're not smart. They only do what the brain and the nervous system tells them to do, which is why when you have a spinal cord injury, they don't work, right? Yeah. And so muscles only, res- they're, they don't only respond, but they often respond to different input. Whether mm-hmm. that's, you know, a change in your posture, change in gravity, change in position, or if there's pain present, what do you do when you naturally have pain? Usually people tense up a little bit. Yeah. So that mechanism happens again very often in the pelvic floor, which yes, can contribute to overactive, overly tense muscles that make it very difficult to achieve penetrative intercourse. Mm-hmm. But when you look at why the muscles are doing that, whether it's pain, because then it's chicken or the egg, right? Or if you zoom out of the pelvic floor and then you ask about the other people in the, other people, other systems in the neighborhood of the pelvis, Mm -hmm. you have your bladder and your bowels. So you'd be surprised how many people have chronic constipation Mm -hmm. that they never address or they don't know how to address. And they're having one to two bowel movements a week. That's a lot of pressure for your pelvic floor to manage. It's a lot of weight to carry around all day. And then here we are saying, oh, if you want to have sex with penetration, you got to relax those muscles. And we're doing breathing exercises, stretches, different things like that to facilitate. But we also have to address the components that are contributing to us to why the muscles are constantly having to tense up like that, like mm-hmm. constipation. For some, pe- for some other people, they might have um, a history of tailbone pain. Maybe they were an ice skater and they fell a bunch of times. And now their pelvic floor, because of the tailbone pain, is a little bit overactive or overly responsive to pressure there. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of reasons why somebody's muscles might not be doing what they're supposed to be doing. The unique thing about penetrative intercourse is that you're asking the muscles to first relax so that they can be more flexible to allow that. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to achieve that, the therapy or the therapeutic process is learning what strategies to use to facilitate, but also what things to adjust or adapt or pay attention to, to make sure that that change, meaning the muscles becoming more flexible Mm -hmm. and lengthened is sustainable, Mm -hmm. right? So I would say that it's zooming in to find out what's bothering that person and then zooming out to figure out, okay, well, how did we get here and how do we make sure that this doesn't keep happening once it gets better? I always tell people it's kind of like driver's ed, right? You don't Mm -hmm. just take driver's ed, you know, drive around with the instructor and everybody's honking at you because you don't know how to drive yet. Mm -hmm. Then you sit for your test then you take the driving test, you get your license, hopefully. That doesn't make you a great driver, right? Mm-hmm. It means you've learned and practiced and understood and showed competence in the fundamentals. Pretty soon, you're going to have to learn how to drive on a freeway. I don't know what they call it in other states. Maybe it's a highway. Mm-hmm. Um, then eventually, you're going to have to learn how to drive in the rain, maybe in the snow, maybe in a pickup truck, maybe in a U-Haul. And yeah. you just keep building on those same skills you learned So the therapy for pelvic floor dysfunction is optimizing bladder function, optimizing bowel regularity, optimizing trunk stability and coordination of your abs, your glutes, all of those other muscles connected to the pelvis so that your pelvic floor muscles can do what they need to do without symptoms. Mm -hmm. And you just learn the basics and continue to get better and better and better at identifying and strategizing certain things to make sure the symptoms don't come back. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an in depth. Mm-hmm. It's that's... it's a lot, and I, I really I, I go that long when I talk about it because I don't want people to think we just teach people kegels all day. Like yeah. that's really what people mm-hmm. think. We're doing kegels on a biofeedback machine, which is an EMG or electric, not electric, electromyography, mm-hmm. where we put sensors externally on the muscles or internally with a probe and teach people what to do with those muscles. And that's a great tool, but that's not all we do. We don't just mm-hmm. teach people how to do kegels. We don't just yeah. treat people who leak urine mm-hmm. when they laugh or cough or sneeze. It's much broader than that. We're really helping people maintain their quality of life. And that's what mm-hmm. I really want people to understand. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think too, people kind of look at Kegels as like the end all be all of the pelvic floor. Oh, like yeah. this is mm-hmm. this is the one thing you got to do and then you're going to be great. And, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. And I don't even think, I think most people are looking at it from a, from a sexual perspective right. that they're going to have all this strength from that. Yeah. Um, I will say a lot of my job is also debunking myths and, you mm-hmm. know, just false 
perception of what's normal and what's, Hmm. what am I, what is my body supposed to be doing that? Or is my body supposed to be doing this? What's wrong with me? And a lot of the times Mm -hmm. it's not what's wrong with me. It's just what, again, what are all the contributing factors, right? And Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell a mental health provider like yourself Mm -hmm. that the musculoskeletal system is one system. It's attached to the rest of you. And you have to think about all the things that, trigger or overwhelm or stimulate a nervous system response that inevitably asks your muscles to be a part of, Mm -hmm. right? Whether that's tension or whether that's relaxing or fight or flight. And so to isolate the pelvic floor and to just kind of water down pelvic floor therapy into just kegels is really like somebody, I guess, walking to mental health and and it's like, oh, don't you just don't I just lay down and tell you my problems and that's it and I feel better, Mm -hmm. right? Like, no, it's it's a two-way street. It's, there's Mm -hmm. strategies, there's discuss, there's reflection, right? There's homework. It's a lot more than people think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what those, some more of those myths are or assumptions (laughs) that people have when they come in? Um, I mean, you said one of them. You Mm -hmm. actually probably know more than I do because I, I tried to not repeat them, but yeah. the yeah. myth that you have to have a tight vagina, like a tight vagina mm-hmm. is a better vagina is yeah. a myth because mm-hmm. vaginas are not, the vagina itself is a tube. Mm-hmm. The pelvic floor supports the tube from underneath at the opening. Mm-hmm. And so the tightness that everybody talks about is actually pelvic floor muscle tension. Mm -hmm. Um, the vagina itself is very flexible. It's meant to stretch and recoil. It's elastic if it's healthy, Mm -hmm. if it's not healthy, it can't do that. So there's this misconception that the more partners you have, particularly if you enjoy penetrative intercourse, your vagina just gets blown out. Mm -hmm. And in reality, over time, the natural physiological changes with hormonal changes like menopause, even postpartum, your vagina actually doesn't blow out. I mean, mechanically, yes, with vaginal birth for, for a little bit in the early postpartum, yeah, there's more laxity. Mm-hmm. But with age and with time and with a decrease in estrogen over that time, your vaginal tissues become less elastic. You lose a lot of the, the natural, they're called rugae, they're folds in the vaginal walls that allow it to kind of stretch like an accordion mm-hmm. and it shrivels up. And when it shrivels up like that, and sometimes in really severe cases, the labias will recede, right? The opening shrinks a little bit. That causes more pain. So when you mm-hmm. want to talk about who does a tight vagina really serve, that's some misogynistic, patriarchal, like historically, mm-hmm. it's, if you look at the word vagina, the Latin root of it, means sheath. Mm. What is a sheath for? A knife or a sword? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's all it's for, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I forgot the fact that it's literally the gateway to life. Yeah. (laughs) Never mind that. But it's, I think that's one of the biggest ones is, oh yeah, tight's better. Mm -hmm. Squeeze, tense it up, keep it tight. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are benefits to that, but it's not, it doesn't have the connotation people think or the derogatory connotation people think when in reality, my postmenopausal patients are struggling with intercourse mm-hmm. because of that, because things have shrank and it's mm-hmm. not fun. So mm-hmm. that's one of the myths. Um, I would say another one is that you need to be doing like 200 kegels a day and holding for like 10 seconds each. Mm-hmm. So I, and, and the best way to describe or the best way to shed light on that is to ask people, well, do you do, you do 200 squats a day? Mm-hmm. Like what other muscle group would you overwork that much? for fun, for no reason. Right. Um, and then not only that, but majority of people who think they're doing kegels are doing them incorrectly unless Mm -hmm. they've been taught through Mm -hmm. an internal exam. And so you can have somebody thinking they're doing kegels and they're just like clenching their butt cheeks or something or squeezing their groin muscles or bearing down even in some cases. So kegels are not, they're not the only way to improve pelvic floor function and, Mm -hmm you're probably doing them not the best way. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So that's another myth. Um, Everybody leaks after having a baby. Everybody just pees themselves when they laugh. It's part of life. Deal with it. Yeah. It's very common, but you don't have to live like that. Mm -hmm. You save a lot of, I mean, do the math, calculate, calculate how many pads you use a day. If you wear pads for leakage or even liners, side note, if you have leakage and you're using liners and pads, 
do not use menstrual liners or pads. They do not absorb mm-hmm. urine the way that they're mm-hmm. supposed to. They, they are designed to absorb blood. Yeah. So use incontinence pads because they are moisture wicking. They work faster than menstrual pads for urine, mm-hmm. but you don't have to live like that. If you're using three or four pads a day and in a pack, there's 30, right? Do the math on how much month or monthly expenses goes to that. When you can go to a therapist, hopefully if you have access, because again, not everybody has access Mm -hmm. and it's so specialized that we're not readily available everywhere. Yeah. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a way, it's a very simple thing that can improve with therapy that people just have accepted the narrative of, Oh, it's just, it's your badge of honor. Mm -hmm. You're a, you're a mom, you're a parent. Now you gave birth. Now you're going to leak every day. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, some people gen- genuinely, they don't want to get better, right? Mm. Some people are told that they need therapy <laughs> and they try that. Like, yeah, I don't like this. Too much work, yeah. too much effort, too much money mm-hmm. for some people. And that's fine. But, um, it's the people that are like, I don't know if this can help me because I, I do kegels all the time. But again, mm. like I just said, that might not be the reason why you're leaking. Right. Yeah. So just the misconception of, yeah, it's common after giving birth, but also kegels aren't the only solution. There's mm-hmm. layers to it, even something as simple as incontinence, but that's a huge one. Oh, you're going to pee your pants. I pee my pants all the time too. It's, <laughs> it's so sad. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what? If you're okay with using the pads and you can afford mm-hmm. that and you're okay with that, that's again, it's your quality of life that we're trying to improve yeah. to whatever extent that you want or need it mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think those are the three main ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm having so many flashbacks to like, few years ago when I would like sneeze and I would like drizzle. Do you or have I would kids? laugh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would, no. Well, that's another myth that it only happens to people who have children. Yeah. But it yeah. actually happens a lot in high level athletes, gymnasts, Ooh. runners, track, track and field athletes, just all of that pressure and all of that movement and all of that muscle um, mm-hmm. functioning all together. Sometimes they leak too. It, yeah. it, it happens. I mean, sometimes like you laugh so hard that you yeah. all like. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and then there's, there's different forms of incontinence. It's not just laughing, coughing and sneezing and exercising. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some yeah. people it's when they wash their hands because they hear running water, mm-hmm. right? Or they are getting home from a long day and they put their key mm-hmm. in the front door and all of a sudden they're like, oh God, I got to pee. And then they got to mm-hmm. run. So that's yeah. called urge incontinence. And some people, they just can't get to the restroom fast enough because maybe, you know, our elderly patients who need to use a walker. Mm-hmm. It's actually the number one reason most women are in nursing homes is stress inc- or uh, urinary incontinence. Huh, Whether didn't that's know because, that. mm-hmm, I forget the percentage. I'll have to look that up, but, um, whether it's because functionally they just can't safely get to the restroom. So they need supervision yeah. or they need help dressing and undressing and hygienically. If you can't change your own pad or change mm-hmm. your own diaper, that's a problem. I mean, imagine mm-hmm. being completely healthy otherwise and you got to live here because or live there in a nursing home because you pee your pants Yeah, when there's therapy for that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's that's one of the saddest parts, but. Yeah. How common would you say the incontinence is in terms of like what you see in your practice? In terms of what I see, I think it's maybe like regardless of childbirth and regardless Mm -hmm. of age, I would say it happens to maybe 70% of people Mm -hmm. or at least they report, even if it's not what they're coming in for, say they, like you just said, I remember I used, that used to happen and it got better. Or when Mm -hmm. I first had my baby and when they were really young, it was a problem, but it kind of went away and I I don't struggle with that anymore. Mm -hmm. But majority of people have experienced it in some form. Um, I would say the people that are dealing with it on a regular basis, that's probably like closer to 40 to 50% of our Mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. Um, And then some people they're coming, they're referred to therapy for something completely different. And then that yeah. comes out that, Oh, Oh, that's not normal. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not, you can help with that. I've, I've peed my pants for years, yeah. but they're coming in for like pain with sex or constipation. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it all comes out eventually, but yeah. 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 Majority I would say. Mm. Well, yeah, if you have constipation, I hope it does all come out eventually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's there was someone in my life recently who um had a lot of pain abdominally and mm-hmm. 
use, goes poop regularly. And mm-hmm. literally mm-hmm. she had to go to the doctors, get all these tests done, got like blood work, all this stuff because she was in so much pain. And they did a scan and they saw that she was just super backed up. Yeah. She's like, but I go regularly. Yeah. That's <laughs> another myth that just because you go daily doesn't mean you're not constipated. Like mm-hmm. There are other factors. Which like kind of makes there. me paranoid. That kind of gives me some <laughs> trust issues. Like how right. do you know? <laughs> right. And and that's the thing. I mean, you could Google some of this. Like some of this isn't specialized care because it's fact, right? Mm-hmm. It's this is what's normal for the body. But again, going back to why is this individual not having regularity based on their lifestyle, based on their diet, based on their activity level, and also their perception of normal. A lot of people just, they don't think to change anything because they think their pattern is normal because mm-hmm. that's all they know. Granted, I don't blame anybody because who's really out there talking about their poop patterns besides people who do what I do. You know? I mean, I wish more people did. I love talking about <laughs> I, it. <laughs> I know some acupuncturists do, obviously nutritionists, um, mm-hmm. physicians, but yeah, it's just one of those things that people don't know what they don't know. So they don't know that there's help yeah. for something, but I would say daily is good. One to one to one or more times a day is, is mm-hmm. considered normal, yeah. but some other benchmarks would just be, is, is, is it a lot of effort? Do you mm-hmm. have to strain? Are you working really hard to empty? And when yeah. you do pass it, does it does the volume is the volume proportional to what that sensation of urge was, or was it just like a little bit? Mm-hmm. And then what is the texture? Right? Is it smooth yeah. and formed? Is it pebbly? Is it liquid? Because that's going to affect it too. Yeah. But also, people don't recognize you can be backed up in the large intestine and you're still having bowel movements, small mm-hmm. because it's stuck. Right. And yeah. then everything around it is continuing to move. So, I mean, squatty potty, everybody needs one. Everybody oh, yeah. needs to have a squatty potty. And that's yeah. actually the original story of it. I don't yeah. know if you, I guess the, the person who designed it, his mom, it's on their website. Mm. <laughs> his mm-hmm. mom was dealing with constipation and was told she, her toilet is too high or something. So yeah. he built it for her. So we have yeah. a saying constipated until proven otherwise because people really don't. They're not, not everybody. Some people are very in touch, very in tune with what's happening because Mm -hmm. they're regular. Like I go Mm -hmm. daily every morning. I have my coffee, right? And then you see Mm -hmm. those memes where it's like, you know, you drink your coffee and then all of a sudden, (laughs) yeah, bowel urgency uh, because it is a stimulant. But Mm -hmm. um, some people are very in touch with it. Others, not so much. Yeah. I just do warm water and then I'm ready to go. And I like that. Yeah. We talk a lot about strategies for improving bowel or establishing a bowel routine to improve regularity. Some people in the most simplest cases, they're just dehydrated. Yes. I was going to say that. I was going to say that, but I was like, I'm not a doctor. Let me not get into that. And and it's not like they're drinking no water. It's just, they don't, they, they are not consistent with it to the point Mm -hmm. where they notice a change in the bowels related to it. Yeah. Right. They drink when they drink water normally. And then if they happen to forget, then they're constipated the next day, but then they don't piece mm-hmm. it together. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, how much water should I be drinking or does sparkling water count? And how about juice or yeah, I drink mm-hmm. coffee. How about that? So it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of factors. It sounds like a ton of educating on your end when you do I, this work. <laughs> I never stop talking. Like I, at the end of the day, I'm I need, I take like a vow of silence. I just, I never stop talking. Yeah. Which is great. It's fun. It's, it's fun educating people, seeing the light bulb go off Mm -hmm. and they're like this whole time. And you know, some people get pissed. They're like, nobody told me (laughs) this whole time. All I had to do is drink more water or eat some prunes. And you know, we reserve some of those things for like, oh, that's for elderly people who have issues. But I'm like, no, do you, can you even define constipation? (laughs) Mm-hmm. And then they tell me what their pattern is. I'm like, that's constipation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, oh, everybody doesn't do this? Yeah. Like, I don't know who you've been talking to, but no. Yeah. But again, I have a different reference point. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's a lot of talking, a lot of education. And a lot yeah. of people just kind of deer in headlights, like thinking about all their past decisions and all their mm-hmm. past habits and thinking like, oh my gosh, I know where this started now. I know what happened. 
but that part's actually really cool cuz you know it's it's self healing it's it's people becoming more in touch with their body their functions mm-hmm. their their daily patterns and their habits and then figuring out how to make better choices and and use better strategies to live a life that is so much better than having to find a restroom all the time or i can't jump on the trampoline cuz i'll pee myself or mm-hmm. abdominal pain i treat a lot of abdominal pain related to digestive Mm. issues and menstrual issues. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm wondering if we can go back a little bit to the muscle piece around Uh our pelvic floor and our vaginal canal as well. Most Mm -hmm. of our listeners um, have vaginas, at least Mm -hmm. as far as I'm aware. Um, (laughs) Definitely not to like, you know, push away the penises. We should talk about them too. Um, But the the benefits of strengthening mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. those muscles in the pelvic floor um yeah. can you touch a little bit on that like yes if you're having some of those problems of like uh, leakage. You know, leakage and whatnot like right. you can have improvement to those but if somebody is not necessarily presenting with painful sex or um sorry painful like penetration or mm-hmm. leakage like what kind of benefits in general does mm-hmm. strengthening the pelvic floor have so it's it's very closely related to abdominal the deep abdominal layer mm-hmm. so stability so for i would say for our mm-hmm. postpartum patients it's huge obviously because mm-hmm. especially if they deliver well if they deliver vaginally obviously the pelvic floor gets impacted there but even with a c section because y- you could have had a c section after trying to push for several hours. Um, And then you have Mm -hmm. a giant incision in your abdominal wall where the pressure management Mm -hmm. has to change. And so I would say the benefit of maybe not just having strong pelvic floor muscles, but just more so being aware of how to engage them, both meaning, meaning both how to contract them or squeeze them or tense them. And relaxing them, lengthening them and making them softer. Mm-hmm. That the benefit of that, I mean, ben- better orgasms, right? Mm-hmm. For some people, less pain with intercourse. And so a lot of people have stronger orgasms, like either they their mm-hmm. orgasms were a lot weaker after giving birth. And so good pelvic floor muscle function means that Again, those bladder, bowel, and sexual function all are more efficient. So whether Mm. that's preventing leakage or more efficient emptying, right? Not having to, you know, some people have a stream of urine that is start, stop, start, Mm -hmm. stop, or it's super narrow and they're sitting on the toilet for like 30 seconds, which I'm sure somebody just heard me say that and they're thinking, is that not normal? Yeah. (laughs) 15 to 20 seconds if your bladder is really full. Mm -hmm. Um, not having to strain on the toilet, right? Straining on the toilet for either bladder or bowels, that can lead to things like hemorrhoids. So Mm -hmm. if you have hemorrhoids, working on your pelvic floor muscles can help with that. Um, uh, Less painful periods, right? We're not affecting the menstrual cycle itself, but we're addressing Mm -hmm. the symptoms associated with it. Uh, And then for, for, I guess for strength, just at the pelvic floor, I guess the biggest benefit is more productive, um, I guess, better sensations down there, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. to me is more for sexual function, but also your ability to then decide what to do with those muscles based on what you're trying to accomplish in that moment or in that function, whether it's emptying your bladder, emptying your bowels. And it's hard to say because again, optimizing bladder and bowel function for so many people can mean so many different things. So Mm -hmm. just think of the worst case scenario, right? Oh, I have to like, it takes me like 15 minutes to poop and I'm having to work really hard and I'm like squirming and holding my breath. Just imagine not having to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine you are, I have a ton of patients with uh, bladder urgency that the minute they need to go, they have a very hard time delaying that. So Mm -hmm. trusting your body to prevent yourself from urinating when you're not ready to Mm -hmm. is huge for some people because I have a lot of patients who tell me, I don't plan a vacation. I don't plan a road trip. I don't plan anything unless I know exactly where every single restroom is. Mm -hmm. And COVID has fucked that up for so many people because they're like, I can't use public restrooms. So I only do one errand at a time, right? Like Mm -hmm. that is not a way to live. And so- yeah. 
that's not just related to the pelvic floor muscles, but those are the things that, you know, functionally get better. Um, but if you're asking directly, I would say orgasms, stronger mm-hmm. orgasms and just better sex life. Um, that would probably be one of the biggest benefits. Yeah. The trust in your body piece, like sounds so big because yeah, I feel like I try to test myself sometimes. Like if my stomach is like, feels like that, like I get that heat, you know, where I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, something's not great. I'm maybe going to have diarrhea. Like I need uh-huh. to like go. You make adjustments, right? You like, you strategize. Yes. Where like, I try to like internally, instead of going straight into like panic mode of like, where's the bathroom? Oh my God, I'm going to need to go. Where I'm like, okay, like breathe. And like, you know, I'll like hold my stomach for a second and I'll just like try to relax. And where I'm like, right. okay, like I'm going to slowly walk to the bathroom and I will be okay. I'm going to make it to the toilet. Right. (laughs) You just perfectly described what we do for either bladder or bowel retraining. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a strategy, right? People don't, Mm -hmm. a lot of people I think inherently know what their body needs or what their body is craving. They just don't know how to, to get there. Mm -hmm. And they, sometimes for some people, they know how to get there, but they don't have the, their body maybe is too restricted, right? They have pain in their spine that limits their ability to do that Mm -hmm. stretch that they were told helps with pelvic floor function. Mm -hmm. And there are certain um, factors at play that limit somebody's ability to build that trust. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of it is also behavioral. It's not, again, it's not just the kegels. It's the nervous system. What you just did was regulate your own nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. Your nervous system controls your bladder and bowel function by communicating with your pelvic floor. So yeah, you can do all the kegels in the world and have the most perfect strength and coordination, but you don't tend to your nervous system. Oh, this is a great example. I give this example like three times a day. Have you ever had a puppy or um, a dog that you had to actually like house, Mm -hmm. is it, what's House, house break train. or house train. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you put the pee pads out, you time it, you watch them, you look at when they get all kind of jittery, yeah. let them out and you, you establish a routine. Mm-hmm. The dog learns, right? All right. If I have to pee, I got to pee here or else I get in trouble or I got to let them know to let me out. And then what happens when your neighbor or your family member comes over to meet your new puppy and they're playing with the dog and everybody's mm-hmm. excited and the puppy pees all over them. Yeah. That mm-hmm. puppy doesn't have a broken pelvic floor right? They were fine just a couple hours ago, right? Their bladder is not broken. They know what to do. Their nervous system just got really overwhelmed and your nervous system can get overwhelmed in a positive or a negative way, right? Mm -hmm. You can be nervous and anxious, or you can be excited and really like, I mean, we actually, I've treated men, penis owners for Mm -hmm. premature ejaculation, Mm -hmm. which can also be a pelvic floor issue, yeah. Right. And so those are the things that people are not aware of and maybe Mm -hmm until they go to therapy or are aware of how therapy works, are they motivated to try it? Cause they think they have this misconception that why well, already, I can Google kegels and mm-hmm. I did, and it didn't help. Right. Yeah. And so those are the things it's, it's, it's a whole body thing. It's, mm-hmm. it's behavioral. It is psychological. It's psychosomatic. It's muscular. It's mm-hmm. everything, yeah. especially cause those visceral systems are that they're heavily related to the nervous system. Yeah. The nervous system piece sounds huge because even in thinking about, you know, preparing for like penetrative sex, like if you are super tense and like do not feel comfortable or are not fully aroused, like those muscles aren't going to be relaxed. You're going to be like really tight and like really just tense to where right. like, yeah, that is going to hurt if somebody's trying to like get up in there and you're like, right. your body is telling you and you're telling your body, mm-hmm. we're not ready. We don't know mm-hmm. if we want this. Yeah. I had a patient who, same thing, pain, pain with vaginal intercourse, eventually took this two week trip to somewhere in Europe, maybe like Italy or something with her husband. And for two weeks they were gone. She came back came for a follow-up appointment. I was like, how did it go? And mm-hmm. we had already been working together for maybe like six months at that time before the vacation. And she came back and she goes, we had sex every day and nothing hurt. <laughs> I was like, I guess you got to move to Italy, right? I guess you got to move to Europe because yeah. it's that, like your new environment. Yeah. You don't have to wake up in the morning for work. Mm-hmm. That's actually a side note. Everybody thinks intercourse is 
for nighttime, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm like, have you ever tried first thing in the morning when you're already relaxed? Yeah. Because yep. your nervous system is just so fresh. You don't yes. even have to do your pelvic floor stretches. I love you don't that, gotta like, do any of that half asleep sex in the morning right. where I'm like, I'm just waking up mm-hmm. and we're going to start. <laughs> right. And granted, I'm not a morning person. So I tell people, if you're not a morning Same. person, you might have I'm to not carve one it out. Either. But how great to discover such a huge difference in your symptoms if you just mm-hmm. change the timing of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Who, When you really think about it, who comes off of a eight hour, nine hour, 10 hour work day, ready to go. (laughs) You got to shower, you got to get some dinner in your system. You got to drink some water. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely treating somebody's experience, Mm -hmm. not just their symptom and not just their pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. I I enjoy it so much. It's, it's one of those things that once people learn how beneficial it is, it's, it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but getting people in the door and recognizing and, you know, building rapport. It's a very vulnerable situation. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially if you are like getting the exams and stuff done as well. Like it's very similar, I would say to like going to like the gynecologist or something. Right. Much more gentle. We don't, well, we Mm -hmm. can use speculums for for certain things, but generally I don't use speculums or stirrups or anything like Mm -hmm. that. So it's Mm -hmm. much more comfortable, much more peaceful, and we don't have to do it. There are other ways that we can Mm -hmm. move forward uh, with the therapy, but you'd be surprised how many people tell me, oh, I told my sister to go to you, or I told my mom Mm -hmm. she should make an appointment, or somebody says, hey, I called to make an appointment. They're going to verify my insurance, and I never see them. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I just know, you know, somebody has to be in a place where they're ready to receive mm-hmm. all of the things that maybe needs to change or needs to be addressed. Yeah. And it's a lot. It's a lot mm-hmm. financially. It's a lot of time for a lot of people. I, mm-hmm. I actually, before this recording, I was with my mental therapist. So mm-hmm. I had my session with her and it was, um, you know, it's, it is a lot of effort. So I get why people yeah. shy away from it. It's basically somebody telling you everything that's wrong with you, right? Like, <laughs> oh, you want to get better? Here's all the things that are contributing to that. <laughs> Let's fix them. And that's overwhelming, right? Like, wow, mm. I got to change the way I eat. I got to change the way I, you know, it's a lot. It's mm-hmm. a lot for some people. So I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you do a lot of like, not just work it like in your, you know, clinical practice, but Mm -hmm. you do a lot of work as well, like on Instagram and on TikTok, like educating people. Um, And I'm wondering if you can, you know, kind of share a little bit of like what feedback has been for you in doing that and like using, you know, this platform and your pages in this Mm -hmm. way. Yeah. So that's been quite a journey. Um, I, I had an Instagram back when it was new. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a millennial, so I'm in my thirties mm-hmm. and I remember being in college and Instagram was the latest yeah. app, right? Yep. And back then it was just everybody posting either f- pictures of food or like selfies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember specifically being in grad school and just getting annoyed with the app and just being like, uh, oh, social media is so boring. And also mm-hmm. I had to study a bunch. So I just deleted oh. it. That must have been 2012. So I hadn't had an Instagram from, Mm -hmm. no, 2000, yeah, 2012 until maybe like three years ago, three Mm -hmm. and a half years ago. So it has changed a lot. And I didn't really, I thought, you know, let me use this to share, you know, spread awareness. And it's kind of Mm -hmm. evolved into bigger than just pelvic health, I think. Mm -hmm. I think 2020 really shifted the way I use it. But I do love talking about, what I do in terms of the pelvic health component, p- component, mm-hmm. but I've also shifted to in using the platform to talk about issues that affect pelvic health, mm-hmm. right? So sure, here's how you can help with incontinence. Here's how you can do a kegel better. Here's how you can relax your pelvic floor. Great. There's a ton of accounts that already do that. Mm-hmm. I found that with my, I guess, personality or I guess the way that I do things or the way that I, I like to utilize social media, I like to engage with people. So I like to open discussions about like, hey, who's experienced this? How was your experience mm-hmm. with therapy? Or give me the reasons why you decided to go or to not go. And just shedding light on all of the factors that contribute to what makes somebody either successful or quote unquote unsuccessful in therapy. Mm. Um, because I found that people follow accounts that they learn from, but in a way that is for me, 
it's more work for me to educate strangers, mm-hmm. right? I don't know yeah. these people. <laughs> well, I know some of them, but mm-hmm. it's 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 a one way street. They're just like consuming yeah. everything, right? Anything you post, anything you create, any graphic, any caption. Yeah, and I that found was me. That- I went all the way through your whole page, and I said, "Oh my gosh, I'm taking <laughs> all this. She is fantastic." <laughs> And, and it's fun. And I, and that, that mm-hmm. part is easy. Like the purely physical therapy based type of information, that's easy, but it's draining in that people have questions like, well, mm-hmm. if I have this, can I do this? Or if I have, my doctor said this yeah. and I'm like, I'm not, you're not I'm their doctor. A therapist. Mm-hmm. I am not your therapist. Mm-hmm. So I've actually found that for me to be sustainable on there and to keep producing content that I think is needed, I had to do it in a way that makes me feel fulfilled mm-hmm. and using it in like my stories or, um, using it to interact with people and get a, a, a feeling of what they find interesting or what's concerning them. Mm-hmm. Or it's, to me, it's become much more broad. And I also teach childbirth education. So mm-hmm. a lot of the people I personally follow on my timeline or my feed yeah. are birth workers and midwives and doulas and other GYNs. And I learn on there. So I'm constantly just on their absorbing content, but also seeing where the holes are in terms of, okay, I see that this physical therapist posted about this exercise or this part of therapy, Mm -hmm. but where the general public might not realize is that might not be appropriate me because of X, Y, and Z, or how can I tell if that's appropriate for me? And so I like to kind of zoom out of just the, let me teach you from a, I have a doctorate this is what I do. This is what it is. Here's the anatomy. Mm -hmm. Here's the exercises. You know, it, that's all great, but I, I get bored with that. So Mm -hmm. I definitely used it a little differently more recently. Mm -hmm. And then just being more vocal about social injustices and reproductive justice. Those things are very overlapped with what I do and what I preach Mm -hmm. both in my childbirth class and as an advocate for my patients. Mm -hmm. So I really can't extrapolate the two anymore. I'm like, if I'm going to be talking about how great pelvic therapy is and I'm not addressing all of the barriers to access and why people have such a stigma about it and being trauma-informed, I'm not really doing the profession justice and I'm not really giving the general public a solid um, interpretation of what Mm -hmm. this is and how it can help them without talking about these topics too. Mm -hmm. So it is education for public health, but it's, it's gotten a little, I don't Mm -hmm. know. I just kind of, I don't plan it. I just, I post what I feel like if, Mm -hmm. if somebody says something interesting in the clinic, I might make a story about it. Right. It just, it just kind of depends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've loved following you and I love all the content that you're putting out and just your whole personality and the way that you share these things, I think is just super, (laughs) super amazing. Um, I do mm want to say I fought TikTok for a long time. Like I was like, I'm not hopping on there with all these teeny boppers dancing in front. No, I'm not doing that. But my cousin was like, no, Q, it's not just that. Here I am saying like, it's more than kegels. Pelvic (laughs) therapy's more than kegels. And I'm like, I don't want to go on TikTok. She was like, no, it's different, but you'll like it because of Mm -hmm. all the features, right? The creativity, Mm -hmm. but the ability to go viral on there is nuts. And I haven't decided, I actually haven't decided fully. I don't like it right now. Like I don't like Mm -hmm. it so far. Mm -hmm. It's just too much. It's, it's constant. The way that that algorithm works and the way that that interface is, it's just like, bam, 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 Mm -hmm. bam. At least Instagram, like, you're on your feed or you're on somebody's stories, you're on reels, you're in your DMs. Like there's mm-hmm. so many more avenues to utilize social media on that app versus TikTok is just mm-hmm. like, it's very aggressive, yeah. but I have enjoyed it. I laugh a lot. I learn mm-hmm. a lot. I think TikTok is this generation's YouTube because mm-hmm. I feel like we learned everything off of YouTube university and now they have TikTok. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've evolved a little bit. I felt like a grouchy yeah. old grandma. I was like, I don't want to go on TikTok. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. here I am now. So never yeah. say never. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel similarly. Um, could you share a little bit of kind of where people can find you on Instagram, on TikTok, anywhere else? Yeah. My handles are the same. It's DRQ underscore DPT. So it's Dr. Q DPT. And yeah, it's the same on Instagram, same on TikTok. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm mostly on Instagram. I use TikTok to create. It's mm-hmm. There's way too many trolls on there. I Yeah, it's a lot. But yeah, um, yeah both 
both of those apps. I don't really use Twitter very much, but um, Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, those are the main ones that I use. Yeah. I've, I've debated, I don't know, do you use Patreon? Like either as a consumer or as a provider? Not as a consumer. I did start one a while back last year. Um, I don't use it now. I have it up if people want to like still um, subscribe and like consider it a contribution to my content on Instagram and and on the podcast. Um, Uh But I don't put content on there just because there's too many places of content to keep up with for me and I'm tired. (laughs) I know. I'm on the fence about it because I've I've debated doing something similar to Patreon where, I don't know. So it's, I'm playing Mm -hmm. with that, but, and then everybody tells me you need to make a YouTube channel. I'm like, are you going to record and edit and do the captions for all these videos? Uh Uh-uh. Like I'm one human being. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mostly Instagram and TikTok, but yeah, I'm pretty interactive on there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. This was amazing. And I hope people check out your page and, you know, follow along with the work that you're doing. And it's all so helpful. And I mean, I think just really helping like normalize talking about these things is so key. So thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thank you so much for making it all the way through and keeping your ears, your hearts, and your minds open. It would mean so much to me if you could take a second or two after listening to this episode to leave a review on iTunes and let me know what you're enjoying about the show. I love reading you know, what your favorite episodes are, where you guys listen, um, and definitely feel free to share this with a friend. I mean, part of how we break down the stigmas around these topics is by talking about them, right? And, and sharing them with more people. So definitely share the podcast. Um, and again, really wanting to include all of you in this podcast. So if you have questions or you want to share a thought or an experience, please send in a voice memo to ask.letstalkaboutit at gmail.com. And I'm really excited to keep having these conversations and uh, breaking down these stigmas. So thank you all so, so, so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and I'll talk to you next time.